Good evening, everyone who's who's either watching live or, or watching the recording on YouTube. Hope everyone had a wonderful Christmas and New Year. We're of course excited for the new year ahead, and uh, we're kicking the year off with um, the colorectal department and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So thank thank you very much for for hosting this. Uh, this is of course our team, uh, Dr. Galandiak being in charge. Uh, this is our disclaimer. Now, as per my custom, a fun fact about Pittsburgh, I learned that the emoticon was invented in Pittsburgh in 1980 by a Carnegie Mellon University computer scientist, Scott Fulm, or Fulman, which, which was an interesting fact. Um, but now, um, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, uh, and this is a special journal club because um, we have Alison Althans, who has been helping us quite a bit behind the scenes since we started in 2020. So she watches every single recording and then picks up pearls of wisdom from the experts and special guests and then sends it to us and then we share that on social media. Um, and so that that's very helpful for us, but also reflects her up to date knowledge of colorectal disease and hopefully that will um, help her be in good stead when it comes to um, clinical fellowships and then when she becomes a colorectal surgeon. So thank you, Ali. Um, now if I can get maybe Dr. Uh, Celebrezzi to talk about his city uh, and, and talk about the, um, the department um, and the institution, please. Uh, good evening, everyone, and, and thanks for the uh, honor of uh letting us host this uh, August meeting here. So, uh, you know, Pittsburgh is a city of bridges, uh, as the slide indicates, and uh, I think the uh, the only city that comes close is Venice, Italy. Um, I don't know if who would want to visit Pittsburgh over Venice, but maybe, maybe just to see the bridges. Um, the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center is a multi-hospital system that services the western half of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the central portion of Pennsylvania, Maryland, West Virginia, and uh, Eastern Ohio. So we have quite a catchment area, several hospitals, and the division of colon rectal surgery within the Department of Surgery uh, is currently has seven members, uh, six board certified colorectal surgeons, uh, and we practice the gamut of colorectal surgery from complex oncologic surgery, complex IBD surgery to benign anal rectal and. Um, we've been a, I, I hope, a powerhouse at, at our institution in, for the last 15 years, and, uh, and that's always exhibited by the influence that we have on, on the residents and the training program when we have a continued increasing number of residents that are interested in colon and rectal surgery and pursuing that career. So I think that's one of the best uh, uh, testaments to the influence that uh, the faculty has had over the years. Uh, at University of Pittsburgh. Uh, people like uh, Ali and I saw Vince Anto was on the line as well. Uh, and we're very proud of the efforts that they've uh, uh, been doing in, in research and towards uh, clinical excellence. Um, we Joining us on the call from the faculty is Dr. Kelly Cunningham uh, and Dr. Robert Tesler. And I, that's the only two I see right at this point. Um, and so uh, I'll turn it over uh, to, I think, Ali, who's doing the first presentation. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, before we before we do that, just a quick poll. So the poll today is: How much confidence do you have in the MRI staging of rectal cancer in your institution? Because I think it's a bit of a um, elephant in the room in terms of making decisions uh, about management of uh, of rectal cancer. Um, so please fill that out. Um, and whilst we're doing that, let's move on to the next slide. Yep, thank you. So the, the paper is uh, the risk of distant metastasis in patients with clinical complete response managed by watch and wait after neoadjuvant therapy for rectal cancer. This paper is from the International Watch and Wait Consortium. Interestingly, both the first author, Laura Hernandez, and the last author, uh, Rodrigo Perez, are heavily involved in the DCR journal and run the Latin American and European DCR discussion forums, respectively. We were hoping to get Dr. Perez to pop in onto the call. Um, he did email, so hopefully he will log, on, log in soon. Um, so this paper will be presented by Dr. Althams, and then we will have comments from Dr. Tesler. 
Uh, so thank you very much and start when you're ready. Okay, thanks Vlad for the intro and thanks Dr. Tesler for uh, moderating this paper. Um, just a brief intro, uh, we know from published literature that about 30% of rectal cancer patients with an initial clinical complete response to neoadjuvant therapy and undergo a watch and wait protocol will develop local regrowth by three years. However, patients can usually be managed with deferred resection without compromised long-term outcomes. On the other hand, less is known about the risk of developing distant METs, and patients with local regrowth may be at a higher risk than their counterparts that sustain a CCR. The authors therefore set out to evaluate risk factors for distant METs in patients with initial CCR. Next slide. To do this, they performed a retrospective analysis of rectal cancer patients in the International Watch and Wait database. They included patients with rectal cancer that received neoadjuvant therapy, had an initial CCR, and were initially managed non-operatively. They used time to event analysis and Cox regression to evaluate the association between distant METs and potential risk factors, with local regrowth being the main exposure of interest. They performed time to event analysis using two scenarios, with decision to watch and wait as time zero in the first scenario, and diagnosis of local regrowth as time zero in the other scenario. They also used conditional survival analysis to evaluate how the impact of identified risk factors may evolve over time. Next slide. 793 patients in the database were eligible for inclusion. With a median follow-up time of 55 months, 10% of patients developed distant METs. In the subset of patients with local regrowth, 24% of patients developed distant METs. Age, sex, T and N stages, radiotherapy dose, and local regrowth were associated with distant METs on univariable analysis. However, only age and local regrowth remain significant on multivariable analysis. Uh, next slide. This figure from the manuscript does a nice job of summarizing all of the different time to event analyses they performed. Considering scenario one, where time zero is when the decision to wash and wait is made, patients with local regrowth who are represented by the gray solid line have lower distant met free survival than those without who are represented by the red solid line. This holds true even when we look at patients that sustain a CCR for five years after the decision to watch and wait is made. Patients that develop local regrowth at this point, which are represented by the gray dotted line, still have worse DMFS than those that continued to sustain their CCR, which is the red dotted line. Considering scenario two, where time zero is when local regrowth is diagnosed, patients with local regrowth represented by the green solid line in this time have similar DMFS to those without, which again is the dotted red line at five years. These findings were sustained on conditional adjusted Cox regression analyses. Next slide. So in this study, the authors identified increasing age and local regrowth as significant predictors of distant METs in patients with an initial CCR. The increased risk of distant METs in patients with local regrowth is present at each year of follow-up through the fifth year of watch and wait. It's possible that patients with both local and distant recurrence may just have more aggressive disease biology, but the authors argue that this seems less likely to be the sole factor at play when patients with local regrowth are developing distant METs five or more years later. They postulate that local recurrence may represent a so-called second hit that independently increases the risk of distant METs. Overall, this finding has implications for surveillance for these patients, like maybe the time of local regrowth should be considered quote unquote time zero rather than the decision to watch and wait. Um, the authors acknowledge several limitations of the study, like patients with local regrowth may have had more intense surveillance leading to increased detection of distant METs. The study included patients from 1991 to 2015 across several, several institutions, so there was significant heterogeneity in systemic therapy res regimens, and the decision to watch and wait was made at the discretion of each center and surgeon. They also included all patients with local regrowth, whether or not they had salvage surgery or therapy, which may have negatively impacted that cohort's outcomes. And finally, they did not include CCR patients undergoing upfront TME, which could have provided an additional comparator of outcomes. Thank you very much for, for such a um, uh, sharp and clear summary. Um, can we please get uh, Dr. Tesla to sort of comment about his thoughts on the paper? Yeah, absolutely. Again, thanks. Thanks, everyone, for uh, for the opportunity to, to to be here and talk about this. This pretty interesting paper. I think it, you know, it it, it highlights a really important question um, mm -hmm. as we think about, um, you know, the long term care of the folks with that we care about who are increasingly um, being candidates for watch and wait, which is, I think, a really great thing for for organ preservation. 
you know, I think this study has some limitations in terms of how I think about it. You know, I don't treat very many patients with pure neoadjuvant radiotherapy alone uh, or chemo radiotherapy um, alone. Now, most of our patients at our center who are locally advanced get upfront TNT um, to optimize the chance for um, watch and wait. Um, so that's, I guess, the first thing. Um, you know, the second thing is I'm I'm intrigued, but also don't totally understand or would want to hear more about the author's, um, you know, thoughts about including these two different time locations about when to start the clock, so to speak, in terms of disease interval towards um, uh, metastases-free survival. Because I think in some ways, at least the way I put it together in terms of the patient's experience, what matters to them is is months and years on this planet from the time they're told they have rectal cancer. Um, and um, so I think that while I understand the idea of putting in how long will folks live without metastases after we identify a regrowth, I think the authors do a great job of, of acknowledging a very important limitation of understanding the ascertainment bias that comes with finding the people with local regrowth are more likely, because of their uh, more intense surveillance, most likely to also identify the distant Mets. So I think that that is re a really important bias that is impossible to account for st uh, statistically, and I think they do a really great job of, of, of outlining the rationale about how that, um, how that dictates um, the interpretation of their findings. Um, and then lastly, yeah, I think understanding the uh, salvage surgery and knowing that folks who do have local regrowth uh, don't often have compromised oncologic outcomes after salvage surgery in terms of overall survival. You know, we don't really have overall survival here. We just have um, uh, distant metastases, free survival, which is kind of a unique outcome, at least in my experience for this paper. And so it can be a little bit difficult to contextualize with some of the other data. But I think overall, I think it, it raises important questions about surveillance and the long-term care of um, uh, watch and wait organ preservation patients who have local regrowth. And I do think that we need to come together as um, uh, and decide on how we're going to surveil these folks long term because they are living longer and uh, that's kind of uncharted territory at the moment. Thank you very much for that. The, the interesting point. We're fortunate enough to have Dr. Perez on, who, who of course is the senior author of this paper. Um, and, and so the, the point you've mentioned before about the two time uh, point, um, uh, Dr. Tesla, maybe, maybe we can get Dr. Perez to comment on that and also just whatever else he, he, he wants to contribute to the discussion, please. Hi, Brad. Uh... Thank you, uh, Ali, and and thank you, um, um, Robert, for the the comments on 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 this particular paper. This is quite a, a you know a challenging challenging um, um, subject by its own. Number one, if you think about it, you know local regrowths are generally a, a small group of of patients, and and that was the sole reason we looked at the international watch and wait database because then you you get a lot of patients with a local regrowth. If you if you think about it, and you look at the Oprah trial, for instance, um, you know after a number of years of running the Oprah trial with a lot of patients, you get twenty patients with a local regrowth, and here we're looking at a much larger cohort of patients of more than two hundred local regrowths. So it, it, that that's one of the strengths of looking at at, at a registry. Uh, on a, on the other hand, obviously we have uh, weaknesses well pointed out uh, re regarding the lack of overall survival and, and so on. So you have to take that into consideration as, as point number one. Uh, number two is, I, I fully agree and I, I, I do understand uh, the issues of, of when to start counting the clocks. And, that, and that's really important that everybody understands. If you think about it, local regrowth, what is a local regrowth? It's it's a cancer that has been always there, and we simply did operation once we discovered that the tumor was there. 
And if, if you think about it, um, uh, when you do TME for, for rectal cancer, regardless of what kind of chemo radiation or TNT you, you, you treated that patient, you removed the primary after TME. And then, you know, you, it's, it, have, it hasn't been so long uh, since the patient has had the rectal cancer in, in situ, and, and you removed it. When you, when you treat a local regrowth, sometimes it's years after they've been treated for rectal cancer by TNT. And then, you, you know, you, you decide there's a local regrowth, and, and then you remove the primary. So the idea of using two time point zeros was to control for the removal of the primary uh, or the, the, you know, the actual uh, treatment with TNT. Because if you compare with patients who undergo TNT, it's probably not fair when you, when you keep the primary in situ for so long uh, after you decide the patient has, has a local regrowth. So that was the point of, 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 of using the two time points. And, and my last point to that is, so when we did a conditional survival analysis, if you think about it, if you have a rectal cancer, if you do TME uh, or a local excision or even watch and wait and you don't have a local regrowth, once these patients reach five years, we usually tell them you're cured. You, the, the risk of having some metastasis is probably so small. It's almost zero. You can go home, open a champagne because there's, it's unlikely you're going to have metastatic disease afterwards. And by, by doing the conditional survival analysis for these patients with the local regrowth, when they reach fires from the primary or from the decision to watch and wait, they still have quite significant risk for distant metastasis. They only have or they only become at very low risk for developing distant metastasis once they complete five years from the time that they re, they developed the local regrowth, uh, instead uh, from the time of the primary, so so it may be the case that when you have a local regrowth, you, you're having a second event, a, a second hit. There's a second thing that is contributing to the risk of of distant metastasis. So that's our concern, and it's a, a little bit disturbing that I you know I've been talking about watch and wait for decades now and i'll be talking in favor of watch and wait for decades now and now all of a sudden i'm the one talking about something to be concerned about with watch and wait because when you have a local regrowth it may be quite significant here that we're actually i'm not sure yet and i'm not convinced that with this very particular subgroup of patients we might have prevented a proportion of distant metastasis had we operated on these patients up front at the time of reassessment of response. I, I hope I, I made myself clear. I know it's it's very challenging to get all, all, all those things out, out from the paper, and I fully agree and I fully um, accept the many limitations that were pointed out uh, from, and, and I think it, one of the, you know, it's one of the uh, of uh, limitations that are inherent uh, uh, or inherently associated when, whenever you have uh, a large registry like this, where where people put in, you know, people put in patients, not necessarily the bad patients. Sometimes they put in what they think is, you know, my perfect patient, and and, and we don't have a, a good, uh, you know, control of the of the denominator. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perez. I just want to, you know. Be very clear that this paper is is a, is a huge accomplishment, and I think introduces, like you suggested, a really important thing that we need to think about going forward. You know, there's no there's no research out there without limitations, and so it's just about, as we all know, acknowledging what those are and cautioning our interpretation to make sure that we are using it wisely. Yeah. Uh, so yes. thank you so much. I, I I agree completely, and that that all that makes makes. Uh, a lot of sense to me. Thank you. Can I make a quick Thank comment? You. Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you, Dr. Perez. That was an interesting, um, you know, take on on your your watch and wait approach and your uh, support of it. And I think if, if we look at definitive care of the rectal cancer, so 
as a, as time zero. So if it's watch and wait and they stay without local recurrence or local regrowth, then the definitive care was at the end when, when watch and wait was declared. But when they have that local regrowth or recurrence, then that, and we do an operation, that becomes the point of definitive care. And I think if we look at it that way, that gives us that, that um, you know, the evidence to support that we should be following those patients from, for five years from that point. And what Dr. Tesler said in his uh, summary was, you know, we, we need to get together and figure out how are we going to follow these patients? Because we know that in colorectal cancer, there is no right or wrong way. There has never been an established follow-up regimen to for these patients. And, and I think it's probably high time that we figure out what that ideal follow-up regimen is and how long it should be. But yes, yeah, so thank you, everybody. Great. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Um, can, can I please ask two questions, both to the panel and Dr. Perez? The, the first um, is about the relationship between local regrowth and a persistence of a polyp. Uh, because I, I think we, I think the previous time we discussed watch and wait, uh, we discussed a paper about uh, the fact that polyps can persist even in the presence of irradiation as opposed to actual invasive disease. So, so how do you differentiate that? Um, and the second thing is, if you have demonstrated um, re regrowth, what do you do with it? Um, we have a paper that we've also featured this month um, called Transanal Endoscopic Microsurgery versus Total Mesorectal Excision for T0-1 Rectal Cancers, and they advocate doing a local excision. Would that be, to me it doesn't sound definitive, but would that be an option or, or, or not? So two questions in that, sorry. Okay, so um, there's a number of reasons why, you know, regrowths happen. Sometimes, yes, some, you know, adenomatous tissue that remains within the periphery of, of these scars may uh, contribute to the, to the regrowth of these cancers. Um, this is not necessarily true for, for all local regrowth, but definitely it's, it's one of the reasons why some of these tumors uh, grow back again into into uh you know full-blown cancer and, and and this is why it's so you know challenging to to assess tumor response and make sure that there isn't any residual disease um again if you think about it it's not a new cancer usually a regrowth is the same cancer we, we just we simply missed it and and because it's it is some it's many times challenging to you know rule out residual disease so that's n n number one uh, number two, you, I would be very careful on doing a local excision for a local regrowth. I, I understand the point, um, and uh, we have ourselves uh, published on, on data looking at local uh, excisions for uh, local regrowths. And to be honest with you, um, the, the reasons and, and the idea of doing a local excision for a local regrowth, to me, makes sense. When the primary cancer, the baseline tumor was already an early stage cancer from the beginning. So if the tumor was a T2 N0 disease in the beginning, you had a complete response or you thought there was a complete response. And then you have a very small local regrowth. That would be a very good uh, potential candidate for a local excision um, if you uh, detected um, uh, at a point where a local excision is technically feasible. But again, if the tumor was a baseline stage one disease, I would probably not a local excision for patients with more advanced stage disease at baseline um, uh, uh, because there's there's a high risk that, uh, you know, the, the primary, uh, the, the local regrowth is probably very similar to what the baseline cancer was in the beginning, meaning that if you had a T, you, you had tumor all the way through the mesorectal fascia or even uh, within mesorectal nodes, and the tumor is regrowing because you missed it, I would be very concerned that uh, we would be missing uh, tumors that are um, uh, beyond the muscularis propria and also within mesorectal nodes. So I would be not very 
um, comfortable in doing a local excision unless the primary tumor is a baseline um, stage one disease. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Dr. Celebrezzi, anything to add? No, I would, I would concur with that statement. Um, you know, if, if it's early stage and it's amenable and it's a regrowth and it's amenable to transient excision, you don't really lose much if, if you can excise it. Um, but if it's, if you're concerned about the nodal disease, uh, then that's a problem. The, my, in my experience, the regrowth, you know, if, if I declared somebody a, a complete clinical response, then they have that, that nice white scar. They have the telangiectasias. There's nothing in the lumen. And so all of the regrowth that I've uh, encountered uh, are deeper within within the wall. So trying to do a transient excision when you may not be able to get a deep margin uh, that's negative, I think it is worrisome. Your first question about polyps and, and not responding to radiation, I think that may be a, a, an issue of the biology. You know, a polyp obviously has not had the same level of genetic mutation as an invasive cancer, and that may be why it's not responsive to radiation. Uh, and I think that the, the, the late recurrences may be uh, those polyps that persisted that we didn't detect and then were able to uh, degenerate further into invasive cancer, you know, especially the patients that have regrowth at three or four years into watch and wait, which unfortunately I've had a couple of those. And that may be the mechanism there rather than really the same tumor. Um, something to think about. We may not be able to, you know, answer that question other than academically, but um, you know, that may be part of the mechanism there and to answer your first part of your question. Thank you for that. Uh, my last question about this paper before we move on, um, uh, sort of uh, the authors talk about distance disease being associated with local regrowth, uh, but not associated with radiation dose. So greater or less than 50.4 gray. Um, and, and I know that in Brazil, I think the doses of radiation are higher than in the US usually. Um, and, and so I was hoping to get Dr. Garanta, who's, uh, we're fortunate to have a medical oncologist on, um, to sort of have his take on um, sort of uh, how this affects the uh, physician oncologist, granted not a radiation oncologist, but in terms of radiation doses, um, does he have a, any views on that? I'm here. Uh, thank you again for including me in this paper. I thought this is a very valuable paper because it, it helps me actually, this paper I've used a lot of times to explain prognosis for patients, especially after they have local relapse and what we're going to do next, right? The, oh my God, it's come back. This is a, definitely a death sentence. That's not the case here, right? Uh, so I think that's one thing in this paper. And I think, uh, I think the next paper, which talks to the value of PCR, also kind of ties into this whole conversation. Now, this paper is, again, uh, is a, literally a treatise, I must say, because you have to go back and take a look at a lot of patients over eras of rectal cancer management, literally eras of rectal cancer management. You know, <coughs> we used to do 5-FU, infusion, surgery, chemotherapy, if you were N+. Plus. <laughs> then we went to TNT, which is a phase two study, and that became the standard of care with chemo and then everything else. So the, <laughs> so the reason I'm bringing all of this up is to me, uh, so by the way, in my practice, when somebody relapses, the clock starts that day. Your five-year, your five-year, uh, life, you know, five-year disease-free survival is reset to that day. And we are following our standard protocols again for whatever it is for the first three years, scans every three to six months, CT scans, because we're worried about elsewhere. And of course, also local location. I can't comment about that because what I can comment is about. So in Brazil and Europe and every place else, I think uh, they tolerate a higher dose of chemotherapy period because of their diet. Ours is a very folate rich diet. So our starting doses are actually reduced. They're like, I think, believe the dosages for Europe and Brazil would be 1,250 milligrams per meter square or something like that, right? Even the radiation dose is high as like most probably 1,000. And here we're not doing that. We're doing 825 because of our folate rich diet. Now, what we have seen and is that, so we've tried to maximize local regional control and all we found was by increasing the dose of, and I'm just commenting about it a little bit out of my 
wheelhouse, but I'm just commenting about the experience I've seen and the data I have read, that increasing the dose of radiation just caused toxicities. And also the other flip side was us increasing the chemotherapy that we gave with um, radiation, like we did four fox, people did cetuximab. I mean, people have tried all kinds of things and they just, just proved that there was just more toxicity. So what does that tell us, right? That the moment you become, and I think this is, I think this is an important thing about the next paper. I think what it tells us is that people who are high risk, high risk node positive, um, node positive T4, A, B, um, et cetera, those pe N2 disease, those people are gonna do, those most probably are the people that are relapsing elsewhere, right? I'm worried about elsewhere. Local regrowth, I think you're exactly right. It could be, you know, usually if I've seen it happen in the first couple of years. I share all my patients with Dr. Celebrezzi and Dr. Cunningham and Dr. Uh, Medich, but that's what's going on here. I think you're right. I think Dr. Perez, you said it right. This is a different biology, right? This is a different biology. This is, this is a different biology. This is radio resistant and chemo resistant. Now the question becomes is, right? The question you got to ask is, with the advent of prospect, right? Is this a discussion that we should like? Again, you know, we're this is a lovely time to be a rectal cancer patient. We have options, right? We have options. Then the, the question becomes is, right? where we're trying to balance toxicity, we're trying to balance uh, survival, et cetera, et cetera. And now with the data from Prospect, which showed a 22 or 25%, 21% uh, PCR rate, which is chemotherapy, does that change how we should start thinking or counseling patients? Sorry, that was a long diatribe, but again, that's my thoughts on the subject. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, I will, um, we will pick up that discussion about Prospect and, and OPRA and other trials and, and uh, I'd be grateful if you give us a bit of a summary in the end. Uh, but I think in the interest of time, I think this has been great. Uh, and let's move on to the second paper, please. So the next paper is uh, titled Patient Survival with YPT0N Plus uh, Following New Adjuvant Therapy in Rectal Cancer. Dr. Kadan is the senior author of this paper, and the paper comes from Mass General in Boston. Uh, and we're fortunate to have Dr. Tamara Bird uh, to present the paper, and then uh, expert commentary by Dr. Kelly Cunningham. Thank you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Yes. Okay. Um, again, my name is Tamara Bird, and I'll be presenting the second paper. Next slide, please. So to begin, a pathologic complete response, also known as T0N0, after neoadjuvant therapy for rectal cancer is associated with increased overall survival. And the authors of this paper cited a few other papers where overall survival outcomes were specifically analyzed for patients who had a complete pathologic response, but they specifically wanted to further understand patients who have a T0 no positive disease classification after neoadjuvant therapy. Number one, because this pathologic classification is not a part of the current rectal cancer staging guidelines, and it may have clinical implications. So their specific aim was to describe the five-year overall survival for rectal cancer patients who develop pathologic T0 no positive disease after neoadjuvant therapy and compare this pathologic classification to other pathologic stages while identifying unique associated factors. Next slide, please. They conducted a retrospective cohort analysis using a national cancer database. Their study population was comprised of all rectal cancer patients who received either total neoadjuvant therapy or chemoradiation, followed by surgical resection between the years of 2006 and 2016. They excluded anyone who had either clinical stage zero or one disease if their clinical stage was unknown, if they had metastatic or recurrent disease, or if their tumor size or nodal status were unknown. They then divided the cohort into the six pathologic categories listed on the slide, and their primary outcome was five-year overall survival. Next slide, please. So their results demonstrated that after neoadjuvant therapy, a pathologic T0 node positive disease classification was associated with a significantly lower five-year overall survival compared to patients who had a complete pathologic response or patients who had a T1 to 2 node negative um, pathologic response. And this was true in both neoadjuvant treatment groups, 
The table below shows the five-year overall survival percentage for those who had T0 no positive disease, and we can see that it's lower compared to the other two groups. Alternatively, after neoadjuvant therapy, those who had a T0 no positive um, response had a significantly higher five-year overall survival when compared them to those who had a T3 to 4 no positive disease. And again, this was true across both neoadjuvant treatment groups. Next slide, please. Um, so to continue, there was no statistically significant difference when looking at patients who had a T0 no positive um, classification compared to people who had either T3 to 4 no negative disease or T1 to 2 no positive disease, again, across both neoadjuvant treatment groups. Having a complete pathologic response and T1 to 2 no negative disease were respectively associated with a 51% and 40% decrease in the hazard rate of death. And finally, older age, male sex, and higher number of positive lymph nodes were associated with a significant decrease in overall survival. And to the left of the screen are the survival curves for um, each group. It's a little difficult to see, but the top graph represents those who had TNT, and the bottom graph represents those who had chemoradiation. Um, the red curves on both graphs represents patients who had a complete pathologic response, and we can see in both groups they had the highest five-year overall survivals. And the most discernible teal curve represents those who had T3 to 4 no positive disease. And we can see that in both groups, they had the lowest overall survivals. Our reference category of patients who had T0 no positive disease is very difficult to actually see their curve, but it falls in between on both graphs. Next slide, please. So the authors highlight a few limitations, including the observational and retrospective nature of the study. There wasn't disease-specific survival information for this cohort, nor was there information on their specific chemotherapy and radiation regimens. However, in conclusion, after neoadjuvant therapy, patients who had a pathologic T0 no positive disease response were associated with the lower five-year overall survival compared to those who had a complete pathologic response or those who had T1 to 2 nodal negative disease. However, they had a higher five-year overall survival compared to those who had T3 to 4 no positive disease. And again, there were no survival differences between those who had T0 no positive disease and T3 to 4 no negative or T1 to 2 no positive disease. And that's all I have. I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Cunningham. Uh, thank you for this uh, fantastic summary. Can I make a quick comment? Uh, I would not think that the this being a retrospective uh, analysis is a flaw of the study because in most, even in breast cancer, where we have the most data, which predicts PCR and prognosis and predicts for response to treatment, all of that data is also retrospective. You, you know, again, the trials that are being done will be, hey, if you have PCR, right, give treatment or do not give treatment. But again, just to, I, I would not consider that a you know limitation of the study. This is a lovely, I thought this was a lovely study. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cunningham, um, what are your thoughts? Well, thanks, Tamara, that was great. I found myself really liking the read of this paper because the concept of the manuscript just made sense, right? Like we all know that the single most important prognostic factor with colorectal uh, cancer patients is lymph node mass. So this just read kind of very smooth. Um, stage one, stage two colorectal cancers, those confined to the bowel wall, survival is in excess of 75%, but once you have lymph node uh, uh, activity uh, with those, uh, you know, moving on to stage three, uh, the numbers plummet almost 30 to 60%. So, um, you know, particularly in the in the era of watch and wait, this is where it gets very interesting. Um, and our group has had several academic discussions during our NAPRAC talks about, um, you know, thoughtful uh, uh, considerations regarding these patients, because it has come up um, this precise topic. And so this pathologic group, this, this T0 N plus group is is the elephant in the room for anyone following watch and wait now. So I'm really interested to see what other people, um, both in this country and internationally, because this is what this meeting is all about, right? Have to say uh, about this topic and, and what we're gonna do to manage this group. And then going back to the poll, how much do we trust our MRIs? Because this is really the only thing that tells us this particular predicament, right? Prior to operating. I just, I just want to, there's one thought I had 
to share about, I think this brings up the question about how long we're waiting between the end of radiation and surgery, because I think you always have to ask yourself, you know, had I just waited another couple months, would that note have been negative? And would that change how the curves go or not? And, you know, I, I think, so I, I just think that it would have been nice to know some of the, um, some of the intervals of the timing and also to know, I don't know if NCDB uh, distinguishes between upper, mid, and lower rectal cancers. I'm not sure they do. And we all know that there's probably some amount of folks out there who are radiating, unfortunately, upper rectal cancers. And so I don't know how that would potentially bias or change the interpretation of these findings, but you know, we, we should try to limit these studies as much as possible to mid and lower rectal cancers. Um, and so, yeah, I guess those, those were my two thoughts about this study, about um, trying to think about time, um, you know, if you just wait longer, will it all melt away? Um, and also distinguishing the anatomy. Um, can I say something? Um, uh, of course. So, um, Kelly, I, 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 I'd like to respond to that. I think it's, it's a very, you know, relevant question. It's, um, and it's, you know, I understand the concern that if you have like a complete response of the primary you may be very well you know um, mistaken for the complete clinical response and then you have a nodal disease that's gonna you know uh, ruin everything but if you think about it and if you look at all of the regrowths that have been published so far and any of the series that have been published even when you look at you know large numbers even if you look at the oprah trial the patients who had a local regrowth rarely had exclusive mesorectal disease within the specimen that was salvaged at the time of a regrowth. The vast majority of local regrowths did have an endoluminal or a transmural component of the disease, meaning that you almost 95% of the times there was a T component. And if there was a T component, I fully understand, you know, the risks and the, you know, the concerns, but in the vast majority of cases, we're not missing the nodes, we're missing the T component of a complete clinical response. Now I understand the concern. I'm even more concerned with the fact that we're actually missing the T component and not necessarily the N component of, of these cancers. I'm, I'm, I'm very much concerned about watch and wait. I'm one of the big proponents of watch and wait for many years, but I, I understand the risks and I'm actually very cautious about, about organ preservation among these patients. And I'm worried more about the T component rather than the N component of the disease simply due to the fact that we don't see many, uh, you know, exclusive mesorectal regrowths. And I'm, I'm not sure how many uh, um, uh, many uh, uh, local regrows you guys have seen, but in, in, in looking at the international watch and wait, when you look at 200 plus local regrows, the ones that were salvaged and had exclusive mesorectal disease were really, really quite rare. The majority have a T component that's eh, eh, as well. That was my comment. Thank you. In relation to the T component, one of the things that I've personally adopted from you is um, sort of this algorithm or, or watch and wait management plan should really only be used for cancers that are palpable or within finger reach. Um, and so I guess my question is uh, for, for the folks in, in uh, Pittsburgh, do you, where is your cutoff for offering watch and wait? And what is your algorithm for surveying them? Uh, because it sounds like that's kind of the uh, one of the Achilles heels. So I agree that, uh, you know, it should be something that you can palpate because that's a big part of the problem. If you can't palpate it, you can't detect that T component of the recurrence. Uh, however, you know, as in a lot of places, we have some challenges with body habitus. And so oftentimes I can't I can't feel a cancer that's uh, below the inferior rectal fold, which I should almost always be able to feel. So I think that that emphasizes the importance of 
the surveillance modalities that we utilize, which of, of course is a combination of endoscopic uh, follow-up and uh, MRI surveillance. Um, and there's a lot of dispute about how, mu how much imaging we should be doing and the cost of imaging and the availability of imaging. So our protocol is to uh, do a flexible sigmoidoscopy every three months the first year, every four months the second year, and then every six months, years three through five. And that includes a digital examination, obviously. Uh, and then MRI, if there's concordance at the time of, of watch and wait declaration, then we get an MRI at 12 and 24 months, and that's it. If there's discordance, then we'll get one at six months, 12 months, and 24 months. And then we get, of course, the CEAs and the CT scans annually for five years. Uh, the CEAs are, are every every uh, three to six months for the first three years. So, you know, that, that's kind of our protocol. Um, and I and I agree that, you know, my experience, although I don't have 200 patients that have had uh, local regrowths, um, I have had a, several, unfortunately, uh, and they are almost always detected by digital exam or flexible sigmoidoscopy. Uh, I've had only one patient that there was an, a nodule on MRI, uh, and that patient had a PET scan done before they came back to see me, uh, and that was and it was a hot it was a hot uh, spot. So that made it easy, even though I couldn't I could feel the I could feel the nodule. Then when I examined the patient, uh, it was certainly extra luminal. Um, so there's again, there's as Dr. Perez pointed out, there's almost always a T component to these local regrowths, uh, and I think that uh, you should, if you're going to have patients and watch and wait, you need to be able to do your own flex sigs. You need to be able to look at those patients frequently because that's how we're going to detect those rec those regrowths and, and intervene at a point where we hopefully prevent the local recurrence. I'm sorry, the distant the distant uh, recurrences. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we're going to have the results of the poll now, and, and with that, uh, it, it may go hand in hand with one of the points from the chat about renewed role for EUS slash FNA for some of the um, um, for, for for some of the sort of um, borderline nodes. Uh, so the question of the poll we had was how much confidence do you place in the MRI staging of rectal cancer in your institution? Um, and so, uh, well, 22% of, uh, of participants uh, are very confident, but the majority are, um, are respectful um, <laughs> of, the, of our colleagues, but, but know that there are limitations of, of the MRI, which I think is reflected in my own personal views as well. Um, uh, so I guess maybe I'll use this opportunity to ask Dr. Perez what, what his take on, on the accuracy of MRI and what are some of the adjuncts that they may be looking in in Brazil and for example is um, endoanal ultrasound, would that be one of those things? Um, so no, uh, I think there is, an, you know, there is a hierarchy in tumor assessment response tool and number one is going to be uh, uh, together digital rectal examination and endoscopy that's number one and, and two and three and four uh, mr is really an adjunct uh, we, we, we want to see any gross disease within the mesorectum lateral nodes uh that we could never operate or see with with, with endoscopy usually when the primary tumor is gone the mesorectal component of it, or, or even the lateral nodes, provided they received the same amount of dose, and you know, it, it's probably they're gonna uh, they're gonna um, disappear as well. So I honestly, I I'm more confident, and I trust more what I feel and what I see with the with the endoscopy rather than radiology. It is very rare when we have a, a, a radiology pointing at out uh, recurring disease in an absolutely normal endoscopy, absolutely normal digital rectal examination. So it's usually the other way around. Yes, we always look at the radiology, we always look at the MR, but again, it's an adjunct to what digital rectal examination endoscopy provides. Uh, so uh, I, I am uh, I am confident. I think we should it. We should be careful looking at it. But I'm uh, I'm driven by endoscopy and digital rectal examination rather than MRI by its own. 
Uh, th thank you very much for that. Um, uh, Dr. Celebrezzi has made a point about, um, so do we trust MRI for follow-up and watch and wait? I guess that that's kind of consistent with, uh, with Dr. Perez's comment. Uh, we did feature another paper this month, um, which I think came from Michigan, commenting about predictors and outcomes of upstaging in rectal cancer patients who did not receive preoperative therapy. And they demonstrated that tumor upstaging was seen in 10% in terms of T stage and 24% in, in, in terms of uh, end stage. In my experience, I think I find that MRIs are probably overstaged rather than understaged and that might be from a psychological uh, sort of reporting that it is safer to call something worse than, than better um, uh, from if one is a radiologist. Um, just because you're not going to get uh, criticized as much, as cynical as it is. Um, but, but I think it is something that concerns me a lot, this disparity uh, between radiology and clinical um, evidence. Um, so anyone else has any comments about this? Uh, because if not, I was going to ask Dr. Garanta another question. Please. Okay, fantastic. So, um, thanks again for, for joining us for what is a colorectal heavy um, audience. Uh, I guess my question to you is in relation to the development of some of the trials that we are now seeing and, and starting to talk about, there's the Rapido, there's the Prodigy 23, there's the Prospect and Opera trials that, that um, you have mentioned. Um, and so, clearly, we can't uh, discuss all those trials in a short period of time, but to give a taste for a colorectal surgeon or a trainee and direction as to how to interpret them, can, can you please give us a, um, your take of how we can use those trials, particularly as some of the results seem to be quite contradictory or the approaches to management seem to be a bit contradictory? I think um, uh, there was a you know, again, these papers all came out in uh, ASCO 2020, and I thought they were uh, really game changers in terms of confirming that we should be uh, taking a neoadjuvant approach, period, for these patients. And watch and wait was was the standard of care. I think it just confirmed uh, what TNT had shown us already. Now, Oprah, Protégé, Rapido, again, you know, the philosophies of this treatment of these trials, uh, you know, Again, the questions you'd ask me, one was long course, one was short course, um, right? The Rapido uh, patients were really high risk, actually, and 2 T4AB, mesorectal fascia involved, right? And uh, Oprah was actually stage two or three rectal adenocarcinoma. So Rapido, uh, I'm, I'm just going to talk about Rapido first, right? And remember, Rapido, you need to have a TME, right? You have to have a TME. So uh, Rapido, I think, was a high-risk patient population. The PCR rates were 28.4%. I think it's like 30%, maybe. But the distant metastases rate was kind of similar, actually. The D, uh, you know, distant metastases free survival in these trials, you could say, was like you know, 80% across uh, both Oprah and um, and uh, Prodigy and Rapido. You know, if you think about it. So I think, yeah, the the PCR rates were different, especially when you compared long course radiation OPRA with short course, right? Uh, Prodigy, oh, by the way, Prodigy also uh, tried to escalate chemotherapy, uh, full Fernox, and that actually plays into what we're going to be talking, uh, like, is going to go into what I'm going to talk about next. So I think, uh, I, I think they're, they may have had different results because they had different patient populations a little bit. Right. Um, you know, again, you had all stage two. That means in Oprah, you had T3 and zero. Right. So uh, I think that ref that is reflected in their survival outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the challenge with with I think the, the rationale of Rapido was that, hey, we got high risk disease. We need to get them to chemotherapy quickly. We need to chase distant disease free survival. And I think that's what kind of drove that trial a little bit, uh, right? So that's my take on Rapido. I mean, again, um, the, the challenge with Rapido is going to become is that, I mean, it has its, like, again, short-course radiation also has its toxicities. 
It's not a gentle treatment, although you cut it short, it's toxic. And it's not been very popular with radiation oncologists, at least at at, uh, at UPMC, given the toxicity. So our standard of care is OPRA, right? I think that OPRA consolidation versus OPRA induction, which is OPRA induction to me is TNT, right? I think the uh, organ preservation rates of 59 versus 43%. And the same, actually, the distant metastasis-free survival was almost the same. So that, to me, is standard of care. So now what can we do better? The problem is becoming is like what you guys talked about. No, what about these node positive patients, right? The stage three, I mean, the outcomes are poor. The node is involved. It's got, we are concerned for elsewhere. So the, the Janus trial is what we are trying to enroll patients on, where we are trying to dose intensify because we can't dose intensify radiation anymore. We can't dose intensify chemotherapy with radiation anymore. Just too toxic. It's been proven it doesn't really work. So what is the next thing left? Chemotherapy uh, in the uh, in the induction in the sorry in the consolidation phase, fulfurnox versus fulfox for distant disease-free survival. Does it make sense? It's a bit harder than cutting things out, but I think it makes a bit of sense. So I think, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Medic, um, I think, was tied up in theatre. Um, or, or um, and uh, I was going to ask him a few questions, but we've actually um, had an excellent discussion and uh, the discussion has gone on for an hour. So th thank you everyone for participating. Um, our next journal club will feature Dr. Tracy Hull um, in the end of February in the last, um, uh, last Monday, and we will be talking about rectovaginal fistulas. Um, in the interval, um, we also want to highlight that we have two uh, discussion um, online meetings, one that Dr. Perez uh, chairs um, and is the Latin um, meeting, um, and the other one is uh, the European meeting, which is uh, run by Dr. Fernandez. So should you be interested in those, please sign up um, and hopefully uh, that will be synergistic to um, uh, the involvement with the journal. Um, thank you all. Oh, and Dr. Perez just said his one is on the 12th of, um, uh, 12th of uh, February. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vlad, for having us. Thanks, Vlad. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having us. Have a good thank time. you, Vlad. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all. Bye.